Welcome. Today I'm going to talk about morality. I've spoken about morality in the past, and that clip was about personal morality. We can talk about personal morality, how a person decides what is moral, and the point of that previous video was that people do not get their morals from any supposed revelation like the Bible, even though many people think they do. In fact, they get them from their religious leaders, from their family, from political leaders, from society in general. So personal morality, we have rules that are fine, uh, do unto others, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule again, which is common to many religions. And the idea is that although we might get a few rules from some revelation, we, our, our religious leaders or someone, decides which rules should be followed and which rules should be ignored. And there's a whole host of laws, for instance, in the Bible that are ignored in the Old and New Testament. And then there are things like many Christians feel fervently that abortion is wrong. Well, whether it's right or wrong, it's certainly not mentioned in the Bible. So they're getting more, their morality from somewhere else than some holy revelation. Um, there are other sources of morality. Here's a famous one, Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. Act in a way such that if everyone acted in that way, you'd, it'd be a world you want to live in. Here it is stated better. Act only according to those rules or maximums where at the same time you should wish it to be universal. And there's another aspect of Kant's categorical imperative about treat people as in Treat people as people, not as ends, not as things. Okay, I won't get into that, but... Now, why not the not-so-golden rule? Take advantage of other people before they take advantage of you. I'm not saying we should do that, but I'm saying that a lot of rules, though good, have no foundation. Other than a supposed foundation of, well, it's in some revelation. Or maybe common sense. Maybe we feel these are good rules. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in a uh, natural theology, would we be able to found our morality on some foundation? And this would not be personal morality because most people would be accepting the common morality, but it would be how would society's leaders, how would the people who specialize in ethics and morality, how, what, on what foundation would they base what they believe? And this is a huge topic. I'm just going to outline one or two points. I'm certainly not going to answer any deep questions. I just want to give a survey. Now, if we have a natural theology and we don't accept any supernatural revelation, then we have the natural world. And science can tell us how the world is, but science can't tell us how the world ought to be, really. And by the way, this has been called this thought has been called Hume's guillotine. So the idea is here's the world of facts. Science does a very good job of explaining that. But what should we do? How do you, so Hume said you can't go from an is to an ought. And that would be the problem. So it might appear that in our system of theology, there's no way to derive a morality. So Science tells us all the things we can do. I could jump off a cliff, right? Science, I mean, there's no physical law to stop me from doing that. But should I? Well, obviously not. But the point is, how do we derive an ought from what we know of the world? So it's as if science tells us, uh, using an analogy, science tells us this, these moves are valid. The knight can move here and here in the game of chess, and the knight can take this. And let's think of chess now as chess where the king is just like any other piece. So there's no law, uh, there's no rule against a king moving in the check or being captured. So that's kind of like science. It can tell us what's possible, but it can't give us any uh, oughts. But using this analogy, so in other words, we're considering chess like checkers, where every piece is equal, and science is just telling us how the pieces move. But as soon as you introduce a goal, an objective, then you can evaluate whether a move is good or not. You can say you ought to do this and you shouldn't do that because if you do that move in chess, your king will be taken and you'll lose the game. Whereas if you do this move, 
you'll be in a good position or whatever. So the point is, you can go from an is to an ought by way of a value or a goal or multiple values, multiple goals. That will take you from an is to an ought. So science tells us the way the world is. And then if we have some value, something we want to achieve, put those two together and you get oughts. And so what ought we to value? Well, uh, Aristotle had this phrase, which I won't attempt to pronounce the Greek, but it translated as human flourishing. Now, that's very vague, but the point is, if we're interested in the well-being of people, of the human race, and even go further and say the well-being of the world, considering the environment and the animals, which ultimately leads to our well-being, often. Uh, I don't know if I'd object to eradicating mosquitoes, for instance, or various diseases. But the point is, if we have a common goal, if we have shared values, then we can get, then go from is to ought. Uh, another principle is the veil of ignorance. The idea is, suppose you were to be born in a society, but you didn't know into what race or ethnic group or gender you'd be born in. You'd want that society to be as fair as possible because you wouldn't want to be born into a ethnic group that was persecuted and uh, treated badly. These are general rules, but my point is, by the way, I, I want to mention that there are people who spend their lives studying this. There are scholarly papers on ethics and morals. One interesting problem I've seen is uh, the trolley problem. Trolley is going to run over five people. You're at the switch and you could divert the trolley to run over one person. Would you do it? And that's a, an ethical problem. In one sense, well, you should save five people at the expense of one. But in another sense, well, if you do nothing, the five people die, but you're not responsible. Except you are in the fact that you didn't throw the lever. But if you throw the lever, you feel like you're killing that one person. Anyway, these things are discussed and there are scholars and people get very deeply into it. But my basic point is that a natural theology could develop a moral system by way of common values. That's basically my general point. Now, there's another point though, we could develop it, but a lot of people today believe that they get their morals from some revealed scripture. So that belief gives their religious leaders authority. If we frankly said there's no re revelation, we're just getting this moral code by uh, way of reason on what is, would that have the authority? Would enough people believe it? And uh, one, I think one problem with the human race is that older and presumably wiser people keep believing the human race and people come in who were born and at seven years old, they believe in this guy. So children have to constantly be educated. And if they aren't, the level of education and sophistication in the human race goes down or in any society or civilization. And so there's a constant pressure moving our general educational level down because babies are being born and they have to be educated. And if they aren't, the general level of intelligence and uh, critical thinking and whatever in the society could decrease. One example, uh, I mentioned critical thinking in a previous video, and this is just one thing that sticks in my mind. There was a hurricane called Katrina, which wiped out a lot of the city of New Orleans about 2005, 2006. And one preacher said that her, the hurricane was a judgment of God against the city of New Orleans. And it's sad that this kind of thinking is still prevalent. I mean, not only did he said it, but he said it because a lot of his followers would believe it. But in that hurricane, not only were hundreds of people lost their lives and thousands of people lost their homes, in particular, 34 elderly and disabled patients in a nursing home drowned. And what does that make God? I mean, if you take that seriously, how can people take that kind of thing seriously? I mean, if I didn't like, let's take a silly example. Suppose I didn't like redhead people, people with red hair. Now, if I went out and killed a lot of redheaded people with red hair, that would be crazy, but it would have some sense. I'm at least going after the people I don't like. But this God, supposedly, doesn't like um, 
homosexuals, so decides to indiscriminately kill people in the city, including 34 elderly people in a nursing home. It makes no sense. But the problem, so the problem here is that there's still a lot of people who believe they get their morals from a revelation. And I wonder if they'd be so easily persuaded to lead a moral life if uh, that were not true, if it was acknowledged that we're getting a moral code based on reason and based on an accurate description of what is. I think that could be done, but it might have trouble being successful. That's what worries me. Okay, well, thank you for listening.